In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicott. To the Vundacast, official podcast of Vundablog.com, the home of whatever. Today's show is broadcast in the fifth dimension. All right, all right, all right. Today's whatever is going to be all about the official Sundance film, The Babadook. Because we just saw it on uh, my Google Play. And we That's right, we didn't it. even leave the bed no. to watch this movie. It's amazing. Um, I'm Danielle. I am Steven. And, uh, so your humble hosts yeah. and uh, podcast gurus here to guide you through our thoughts and feelings on uh, this week's midnight movie matinee. Yeah, we still have sub things. How many sub things are we going to have? Just We saw the Babadook and we fucking feel like talking about it. That's pretty much where I'm at right now. It's been a while since we did a podcast. Uh, we've been very busy, as you know. The holidays, December and November, are sort of the craziest months in the universe for everyone. I wrote fifty thousand words in thirty days. I won NaNoWriMo for the first time in six years. If you do not know what NaNoWriMo is, it is National Novel Writing Month, where you can write fifty thousand or more words um, from scratch. I am going to gloat a little bit because I wrote 18,000 words on the last day, on the 30th, before 11.59 p.m. My ass was up from 3 in the morning and I wrote 18,000 words. I would never recommend that. My hands were so tired that Stephen had to massage them as they were literally becoming paralyzed. They were stiffening. Like I was, I was experiencing rigor mortis. Or whatever the form of rigor mortis. No, your hands didn't die and then freeze up and then <laughs> come back to life. Whatever that is, you I had was... to read an incantation <laughs> from a sacred text to revive your hands to finish the story. You would not think that typing so much would cause you so much pain, but let me tell you something: I could barely sleep. My hands were throbbing, but I fucking did it. I won, and I did it, and it was amazing. And I'm sure that this the most piece horrible piece of crap that I've ever written, but that's okay. Because I did it. Anyway, Stephen also finished two screenplays two. for National Novel Writing Month, which is pretty amazing. I didn't write them both in one month, but I had started them before the month and finished them and both. And finished them, which but I did write over a hundred pages, which is the goal. He wanted for... to. Uh, he wanted to do this all year. He's been trying to finish these scripts for a long time, so he also accomplished that. Uh, we had a great Christmas. Got some really cool stuff. Cool stuff. Lots of cool stuff. Lots, lots of yeah, cool lots of cool T-shirts and uh, interesting uh, objects. <laughs> yeah, I got a business card holder so I can handle all my business cards, Green Lantern style. Now he's professional. That's right. We ate very good food. We spent time with family, and then today we decided to watch The Babadook because I've been wanting to see it, and I love horror movies. Even though I'm the idiot who will stay up all night because I'm scared of them, as I did last night. Where I was very scared. I was, I was, I had a terrible dream, but I also was terrified of the Babadook all night last night. And uh, Stephen woke me up at around like three in the morning or something like that. I guess he had to go to the bathroom, and he was like, "Baby, oh, let's watch the Babadook now." And I couldn't even open my eyes. I was like, "Please don't talk about that right now." I was like, "I couldn't sleep because I was that scared of it, and I didn't want to open my eyes because I was sure that if I opened my eyes, the Babadook was coming to fucking get me." So we had to wait till like nine in the morning. <laughs> For the sun to be up and all <laughs> to be right to in the be world. All to be right in the world, and then we put on the Baba Duke. Um, if for background, Baba Duke is directed by Jennifer Kent. She is an Australian director. 
um, she actually released, um, this is her first feature length film, but she had well, a short called Monster that I actually watched in college that also scared the ever living crap out of me and it was only five minutes. I couldn't even finish the short. Um, they played it. I, I went to Florida State and they have a great movie theater there and a wonderful film committee that plans and picks out all these amazing indie films and big budget films for the students to come and watch and enjoy. Um, we have a concession stand. I'm doing a plug for the Florida State Film Committee, but <laughs> uh, we have concession stands there. I mean, basically, like, going after FSU is one of the highlights, I think, of the campus is that we have our own movie theater and we get to pick, you know, students pick the movies for the kids to watch and they try to pick a very... Um, diverse array of films. We do film festivals. We do all kinds of stuff. And I loved doing that in my four years. And so I remember they put this short um, before another movie. I can't remember what the other movie was, but I do remember the short. It, it wasn't about... The, the monster was like a, it was like a real horror movie, right? It wasn't like about AIDS or it anything was, or no, HIV. it was a short Because I once saw a short called The Monster. And it was about AIDS. It was about AIDS and HIV, and it was like an inner city thing where no. they where everyone was just like, you got the monster! No. <laughs> <laughs> And the monster was code for HIV AIDS. <laughs> what kind of weird? That sounds like some strange Lifetime special. Uh, I don't know. It was like a 15 minute film that we saw in high school oh, to like wow. convince us not to get AIDS. <laughs> yeah, as if you need convincing not to get AIDS. Uh, hey kids, I know you think AIDS is cool, but no, this was uh, definitely a short film called Monster about a monster. And it, um, if you've seen the Babadook, before we get into it, the monster is actually very similar to the structure of Babadook. It's about a mother reading a bedtime story to a child and the, the child being scared of monsters under his bed. It just so happens that the monster happens to be real. Um, and it even, it had, the, the monster is, if you've seen Monster, you've actually kind of experienced the basic structure of the plot of ba the okay. Duke. Watching it, it basically was step one, two, three, except obviously the Baba Duke is a much more in-depth and fascinating story. So now let's get into the meaty. Wait, wait, before what? we get into what? the meaty before meat of the meat. Yes. Just, you'd recommend the movie. It's a very, I, I'd recommend it. It's a oh, creepy yes. film. If you'd like to stop here before spoilers. Before um, watching the movie and then come back to us. I think that it's a fascinating movie. I think there was something that I read um, I can't remember, I can't credit the source, I apologize, but they said the movie, but the Duke refuses to distinguish between the psychological horror and the supernatural. And I agree. I think that when you watch this movie, you don't know, is it all in, is it all in her mind? Is it real? You know, it's a, it's a great, it's a, it's a very good movie in general, whether, just despite the fact of being in the horror genre. Yeah. You know, sometimes horror genre gets very like step one, step two, step three, and we expect it to scare us, and that's what we kind of come there for. We don't really come there to learn anything else about the movie. But I think the Baba Duke is more than just a horror movie. The horror comes from the very human aspect of the story. And so, yeah, if you love psychological horror, if you um if you're very interested in the idea of grief, um, depiction of grief and 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 and, and humans coping with strong emotions that we like, don't seem like we could ever get past. I think the Baba Duke is a great film. Um, the actress Essie James, I mean Essie Davis. I'm sorry, Essie James. That's the weirdest. And Essie Davis um, is the actress who plays the mother, and she is fantastic in this film. Um, the son, played by Noah Weissman. This is his first movie. He is also fan. Everyone in this cast. Yeah, is all great. the acting is really good for the most part, based on your taste. Very real. It fit our taste. Very I thought it real. worked. It was very real, very subtle. Um, it's I a it's a slow burn. You know, it starts off slow, but it builds nicely. And by the time you're into like the meat of like the horror of the film. You're just dying to get out of it again. You're like, please, just everything be okay. Yeah, you really feel... I think the thing that's great, uh, you feel for these characters a lot. And so you don't want them... To, you don't want these bad things to happen to them. And um, so you really do feel... You really feel the grittiness and the, and the terror of the story. And so that is our non, non-spoiler review as we're going to get. Time I to get would, into the spoilers? I would definitely check it out. Yes. <laughs> spoilers, spoilers. These are the spoilers. Spoilers! He loves that fucking thing. I don't understand. Anyway. 
Okay, so spoilers for those who do not care or for those who have already mm. seen the movie and want to hear our honest review full of facts about the film. Uh, we just saw it, so it's pretty fresh in our brain. Um, this movie, before I watched it, scared the crap out of me. The trailer mm. scared the crap out of me. The idea mm. of a creepy man in the show. I, I'm very scared by supernatural horror. I know a lot of people, you know, everyone has different things that they're afraid of. Some people are, get terrified of slasher films um, because they think, you know, a psycho attacking yeah, you with at a knife At any moment, scary. someone could stab you in the neck. Um, you know, some people get scared of those ridiculous movies where, like, torture serial killers and stuff like that. The thing that I'm afraid of, and I was talking, actually talking to my brother about this before, I'm afraid of the moment before the monster jumps out at you. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid of the moment when you there's someone in your house and you don't see them. I'm terrified of that that unknown invasive feeling. And that's why I love a good ghost story. Because I think a good ghost story basically is telling you there's something in your house. You can't touch it. You may not always be able to see it. But it's there waiting for you. And is it good? Is it bad? What does it want? Does it even matter what it wants? The whole point is there's like this presence in your home that's foreign, that totally dis. Your home is supposed to be the place you feel safe. You know, mm-hmm. I describe it as, and this is weird and random, but I'll go back on topic. What happens when you come home? You, the first thing you want to do when you come home, you always tend to want to pee, right? And you always wonder, and you sit there. What? Every time I come home, you want to pee. You go all of a sudden. You have to go to the bathroom, right? Like no, most of the time, when you come home after a long day of work, you think you're like staking your territory. No, you're, like, listen, your territory? you're not listening to what I'm saying. But but like, do you agree with me that after you come home from a long day of work, the first thing you tend to want to do is go to the bathroom? It kind of happens to you. Like you come home and all of a sudden you like gotta gotta go to the bathroom or whatever. Maybe maybe you're just holding it from before. You're not necessarily. No. What if you're not just holding it? What if you're like? What if you had already went to the bathroom like 15 times and all of a sudden you come home and you go to the bathroom? Do you know why you feel like that? Why? Because immediately your body relaxes when you're in your home. When you feel safe in your home, you feel safe enough to do whatever. I am, like, when I come home, even if I've already peed, like, 15 times at work and I didn't hold it in, when you come home, what's the first thing? You feel, you relax a little bit, you go to sit down and watch some TV, all of a sudden you're like, crap, I have to pee. It's because you literally are, like, relaxing. There's a psychological effect of coming home to a safe space that has that on your body. Why do you think some people, like... They, when it's so important for them to get home. We get so stressed and, and anxious when we can't go home. You know what I mean? When we're stuck somewhere and we can't be safe. Your home is supposed to be a safe space. That's an interesting theory. Please tweet us at... <laughs> please tweet us at Vundablog or at Vundacast, V-U-N-D-A-C-A-S-T. If you pee as, after you get home. If you feel that sense of relaxation and it makes you want to pee. Okay. So. I know that's stupid, but I'm serious. Like, I, I, that's the We're only... interested in your urine. This may seem random, but that's <laughs> the only way I can describe it. It's like that feeling of you come home and it's like this whoosh sense of the world washing off you coming into like a safe space, right? So imagine how horrifying it is when you come home and your space is not safe. And it doesn't necessarily have to be monsters. It can be if you live, you know, I mean, if you want to get dark with it, if you live in an abusive home, if you live... If you, if you have things you're dealing with, issues, when your home becomes an unsafe space, it's terrible. Everyone should have a place where they can feel safe. Mm-hmm. It's why homelessness scares us so much. It's the idea that we don't have a place to go where we can feel protected and away from other people. Because sometimes you need to be away from other people. Sometimes you need to feel like strangers who, you know what I mean, can't just come into your space and disrupt your like, comfort level. The sense of home is important. So to me, the horror of supernatural ghost stories and demon possession stories is that it always is about disrupting the safe space of the home. It's an imbalance in the home home. ecosystem. Exactly. And I think it's a great metaphor for a lot of things. And I think the best horror movies about the supernatural tend to deal with that idea of it being something else. Like maybe the horror... Like, for instance, The Shining. Um, If you've read the book or seen the movie... The horror of The Shining, I mean, obviously they're going into a foreign space, they're going to, but the horror of The Shining starts before that. Because the father, especially if you read the books, the father is an abusive father. He has injured, this, in the in the books, he's already broken the son's arm. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and all kinds of stuff. But in the movie, 
Stanley Kubrick does a great thing by building up that already sense of horror because of actually of the mother of um what is the actress's name the fantastic actress who plays the wife oh. don't look at me I'm not, I don't know I know I'm gonna look it up right now because I I always refer to her as like olive oil because that's who she reminds she me of she does look like olive oil doesn't she Shelley Duvall Shelley Duvall yeah she the Kubrick does the concept of the abusive father great because she is so broken when you look at her she's meek she's timid mm-hmm. she's broken and her son is already so like that's the whole point the horror of the shining isn't even the the supernatural it's the father is the father is the imbalance in the home and so all the supernatural shit that happens to them when they get to the hotel in the in the movies I mean, in the books, I'm sorry, they actually run, to, they go to the hotel to escape what's happened because he is, has an anger issue uh-huh. and they go there to like get away. So I think maybe there's more space. He exactly. Won't be so, but you know. exactly. But that's, but the whole point is, is that he is the imbalance. And so the horror of the ghosts coming in are just, it's just, more, it's just additional. You know what I mean? And what it really is about, the real horror is the father. And in The Shining, the father becomes the main antagonist. Uh, yeah. He's the killer. Why? Because whatever the supernatural force is knows the imbalance is already in him and t- exploits it. And that's kind of what happens in The Duke. Duke. Exactly. You think maybe in the beginning maybe the kid is going to be the vessel for the horror or whatever. But it's actually the mother who gets taken over. And that's, um, yeah, and that's why I love Super. And then you realize that it's not just the mother, it's the entire house. It's, it's, it's th- well, let's just start at the beginning. The movie starts, um, Amelia is the name of the characters, the mother, and uh, the son's name is Samuel. Um, you basically learn very early on that uh, the mother was having her son the night that her husband was killed in a car accident. So, um, the first sequence is a dream sequence where she's in the car, like going into labor and this husband is, you know, trying to be supportive and all of a sudden there's just it's all very abstract. It's very abstract. Um, you may not know, I mean, if you, you know, you may not know at first what's going on, but you kind of get a sense that something's happened. And then obviously, you know, very quickly they they establish the father is dead. The son is alive, and the day that her son was born was also the day that her husband died. And the son is a bit of a tinkerer. He's, like, making all these cool contraptions, like he's ready for, like, Home Alone 4. <laughs> the son is, you immediately get a sense that the son is, you know, special, different. He's super smart. A little, a little, unhi- a little unhinged, a little, a little out there. He doesn't get along with the other children because he has strange ideas. He's obsessed. He has an obsessive personality. Um, and I think that... I think, once again, the imbalance is immediately established. When you look at this woman, she's beautiful and pretty, but she's, she looks tired. She looks yeah, tired. And she looks a little frazzled. Excellent work by the makeup department and by her... By the hair department. By her trying to look tired. I love actresses She did a great that acting, can, tired. Yeah, I love, that, I love that actresses that can transform their faces like that and really give you a sense of what's going on. And I think that... Um, Essie Davis does a great, great job because you see her and she's, she's obviously pretty. You see her and she's a beautiful woman, but you can sense the tiredness in her already. Even before the whole event of the movie gets worse and the stress increases, you see that she's kind of tired. She's tired of dealing with her son who's constantly worried about monsters under the bed, monsters in the closet. Um, And this is before, you know, the Baba Duke is even established in the film. It's just, you already get a sense that the kid has an overactive imagination and it's, it's beginning done... to manifest in a very negative way, and and the kid does, and he's very clingy and codependent on his mother. And the way they shoot that too, it's very it reminded me a little bit of like Wes Anderson with like really well composited shots of them in the middle mm-hmm. of like their closet, looking into the closet, and her opening and closing the doors, mm-hmm. and it really gave that sense of like familial normalcy. And they even repeat the shots later. Exactly. After they introduce the idea of like the Babadook. You, can, you already establish that this, this concept that he is terrified of monsters is is a daily thing they have to deal with. Yeah. Um, obviously, and the movie goes along, you... I mean, before the Babadook is even established, you see that this woman is... She's still experiencing grief. It's been seven years since her husband died, and she's still not over it. Yeah, and her, you know her son I mean? is a constant her reminder of that. Her son is a that. constant reminder, and the more difficult his behavior that gets the more 
unhinged, even the more upset she gets about it. I think I think that it explores And she has um, a hard job dealing with old people that must be dying and you I, know, I, I, through their the own thing, stages think, of depression I and stuff like that. I think that she I think what's interesting is the choice of the career um the choice it's not even career, the choice of the job they pick for her. She's around people that are half out she's sort of living in this dream. You know what I mean? Yeah, she's dealing with the dementia ward. Exactly. So they're like, all I mean, little I think off. all those little things are purposeful. She's she's dealing with people that are not really present because she's not really present. You know what I mean? She's still she's still stuck in that place. She's still dreaming about her husband dying. She she's she's not present. She's trying to be in and out. You know, I think that I think that imbalance goes into the son because obviously the son he's very obsessed with the idea of protecting his mother and taking care of her. I think he senses that she is not present. I think he senses, you know what I mean? He senses that no matter what people think, you know, when something tragic happens and you can connect it to another person, you can put feelings of blame on that person, whether or not you want to or not. Mm -hmm. And obvious and kids are super perceptive. I know I read, I read a couple of reviews before I saw this movie that said people, some people said, Oh, the kid, they didn't go into details, but they said, Oh, the kid is so fucking annoying. And I don't, I, and funnily enough, I, you know, I wanted to think, oh, I'm going to watch this movie and I'm going to think this kid is the devil. But you could see every reason why this kid is the way he is. His mother has not gotten over the death of his father. And every day that he, she looks at him, she's seeing her dead husband, right? And, she, and what is she seeing? Her dead husband died trying to take her to give birth to her son. Kids are perceptive as shit. They yeah. sense when you're angry. They sense when you're sad. They know and they can feel it. And you can see this kid is trying to take control of this world the only way he knows how. By becoming... By accepting the truth, speaking it, accepting, and she can't accept it and, and speak and, the know, truth. By, and know? by being in control, by being aggressive. When she says, oh, he's aggressive and he brings weapons to school. And that's a, there's an instance where like the teachers are like, look, we can't have this kid. He's doing this not... It's not necessarily, you know, sometimes, you know, we think, oh, the kid's a psycho. He's like, he's not a psycho. The kid's not a psycho. Like, this isn't a story. At first, and what's funny is that it was at first, it was kind of interesting because I thought that maybe that's where the story was going. That the kid is actually like a little sociopath. Mm -hmm. And that he's like, but no, that's not what it is. As the story goes along, and he may have been clever enough to make a pop up book, you know, that has Baba Duke in it. Well, you're jumping ahead. No, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead. I mean, like the kid, um, the kid, like, well, you can. I first you think, oh, you know, maybe this kid is like a little psycho. He's a little shining kid. He's you know a little devil boy. But that well, the more you see him, the more you realize he's not. Nessus, it's not that he's violent for violence sake he actually believes that he he thinks he's fighting a war and maybe the war that he's fighting is for his own mother's sanity mm -hmm. you know what i mean and he doesn't even realize it so i think that that they, they established that really well and then obviously yes as you go on we encounter one night after a bad day you know what i mean after after a, a day of 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 this of school and all that kind of problems they open they pick up a book off the shelf. He picks up a book off the shelf and it's called The Babadook. Um, just, first of all, let me just say, whoever wrote that book and illustrated it, uh, you scared the shit out of me. <laughs> like, that book is terrifying. Um, it, just the illustrations alone are so creepy. Yeah, super creepy. And nothing is creepier than, like, an eerie rhyme. I don't know what it is about, like, an eerie rhyme. I guess it just reminds it's us of, the, like... It's the perfectness of it. It's, like, the inevitability the, of, of... the rhyme, yeah. Like, as soon as they say bed, you're like, oh, no, it's gonna rhyme with dead, you know? Yeah. Like, it's... Yeah, I think there's just something about a rhyme, because it, it kind of... I guess maybe if we look at it, it kind of feels like a prayer. Yeah. You know? And so, and a prayer feels... And a prayer's... And when we pray, it's kind of like a wish. Or an incantation. Or an incantation. Or exactly. It's got this very, like, hypnotizing sort of feeling to it. And you read it, and the more... And the, you keep reading it, and then it's like it feels like you're bringing it to life. So, the book... She begins to read the book, and um, she quickly realizes that there's something very fucking wrong with this book. So, she stops reading she and stops just reading. reads it in her head. And reads... Exactly. For the, so, the kid doesn't and hear it. And she hides it. But, of course, it's too late. The, the kid is, is our done. the damage is done. The kid is terrified. The molecule of fear has been established, and it's so fantastic the way that they handle this because you can really see how much this kid is so affected by this idea of monsters and 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 bad things and shadows and 
So he's just distraught. And you can also see how much she she regrets reading the story already because he, she knows that it's just going to be nothing but trouble for her. Like, you can see the exhaustion on her face when he's crying and she knows like she's already in it. You know what I mean? Like, anything that this kid is told is becomes the holy grail. Um, she takes the book, she reads it herself. She looks at it and then she puts it away because she's like, okay, I don't know what the hell. Obviously, there's questions running through your head. Like, does she ever think where the fuck did this book come from? I mean, I'm sure she did. Um, there's also a very And the book is creepy too because there's like empty pages in the back. back yeah. Like it's unfinished. It's unfinished. And... Um, there's no maker seal. There's no printed yeah. in. Obviously, you know. And the, obviously... the imagery in the book is like this like shadowy figure with like a black top hat and like. A uh, very spooky smile, sort of. Strange. And it's like Mister Babadook, and then there's like a little Mister Babadook. Duck, duck is like the little incantation that he says when he arrives. So I mean, I don't. Know, I just think that those first few like twenty minutes of the movie are so good because they establish immediately establish like where the characters are at, the fear. Like this book is just the book alone is so fucking scary. Like when you're reading this, you're mm-hmm. like, where the fuck did this shit come from? An interesting theory I have is as the movie goes along, if you see the movie, is the book even real? Because the only people that ever see the book are the son, Amelia, and Samuel, the boy and, the, the boy and his mother. Those are the only people that ever see this book. Yeah. She, at one point, when she believes that someone is stalking her and her child because, you know, um, there's a sequence where she tries to destroy the book and the book reappears with extra pages uh basically telling her like the more you deny that i exist the more real i become which is horror i mean it's just like shivers running down your spine i mean at least for me yeah. and it gives clues as to the end of the of film the, of the film as well exactly and um she goes to tell the cops but she doesn't have the book she burns it and then in that moment like you see them and it's just so like it's like do, is this book even real does the book exist does it at all because the only people that ever see it are the son and the mother. I think that's what's so great too is because it's it plays on our idea of we don't think of kids as reliable narrators. And that's both a good and a bad thing. I think a lot of times kids don't get believed when they tell stories about abuse or other things like that because people think kids make things up all the time. And they do and they can. But kids also tend to make things up when they're trying to cope with real life situations. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, and so I think what's great is that do you realize that the kid is sort of an unreliable narrator? And so is she, because if she's stressed and sleep deprived and depressed and the kid is playing, you know, in absorbing all those feelings and also like obsessed with monsters and demons and whatever, how do we know if either of them are really the secure and i think that's what's great. yeah it never gives you a reliable narrator to it trust. never gives you a reliable narrator i think that's great because so many times in these movies we always think oh the, the the parent is the reliable narrator and the kid is just like kooky and crazy it's like no not neither of them are together they're both like totally like freaked out anyway so obviously they read the book and then things kind of start going downhill um i think what's creepy about the story is like i said there's no distinguishing between what is fantasy and what is reality um and i think that it does it so well for instance like there's an increasing lack of sleep between the two of them um and even worse at one point um amelia gets very distraught because her kid is like just too much freaking out and then he has a a really horrifying moment in the car where they're driving back i think they were at the party or something like that yeah they were at the party and he looks to his um passenger his, side he looks at the passenger side and just starts yelling at the passenger side and then he get turns, out get out yeah get out get out and then he turns white and starts having a seizure and he acts like as if something entering him or leaving him or yeah something. i mean it's and it's great because it's like it's so horrifying because he turned like super pale. Mm-hmm. It looked like the life was being sucked out of him or something. She goes to see this, the doctor and she admits to the doctor that her son is not well and that something's going wrong and he's seeing monsters and it's not like normal. And um, 
he gives the kid drugs. At this point, the kid becomes even more of an unreliable narrator because now the kid is on sleeping drugs. Is on sleeping pills, which can make you kind of kooky. The worst part too is the mother does, you know, creates this. She gets the sleeping pills to to help him sleep so she can sleep, but. She ends up staying up even later, and then she tries to force the kid to stay up because she starts to become very scared of what she, you know, she thought at first wasn't real but could be real, and you know what I mean. And 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 so it's like they become even more of this like, what like what is really going on in this life? Is there really a monster? Is there not a monster? And does it even matter if it's real or not? I mean, like just these people are terrified. These people are are being tormented in their own home. By whether or not their own psyche or something else. I don't know. Your thoughts? I'm talking a lot. You're talking just fine. Um, <laughs> the the movie then, uh, it plays a lot with the slow build. It r- lives in that fear before the actual pop-out scare. Um it, what it reminded me of was it reminded it, it seemed like the movie saw that one scene in The Conjuring <laughs> where the kid is like staring into like her room into the corner of the darkness of her room and seeing something that we can't see but like is like so scared by it that was kind of the effect of the entire movie you're staring yeah. at these dark spaces and, and waiting for something there. to pop out but nothing pops out yet and if it does it just like is a glimpse for a second and it has moments where it pays off and delivers, you know, you got to see like a cool crawling CGI thing on a roof. You got but to it's see never, it's never overt. Like there's never just here's the monster. Boom. Yeah. It's always in shadow. It's always lit. Especially at the end of the movie and or whatever, you're in spoilerville. At the end of the movie, when usually like in the movie Mama you get like this like really long shot you get to stare at the monster the at creature. the monster you get to take it in and it's horrifying and in this movie you get to look at it but it's just shadow with like two like arm lines that are outstretched you never see and it face. works it does it absolutely works because it's just so like what is this thing you know what i mean and i think that adds even more to the idea that if it's all just in their in their minds, they're just staring at shadows. You know what I mean? Stephen is convinced that it no, it's real. Baba Duke is real. Is real. It's monster. a magic monster. And and I don't. I mean, but how I, did it come into their lives? Is it just from being sad for a long time? The Baba Duke finds is, you. Is the literally is literally the Baba Duke like the in total embodiment of her grief? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's why at the end of the movie offers this like. Amb- ambiguous sort of idea that like all of a sudden this thing is living in the basement there's something in the basement and um you know in this last sequence you get this really powerful moment where she um and this actually harkens back if you've seen um monster the short mm-hmm. this is exactly what happens in the short oh yeah she, she screams it. at it and she says, don't you dare miss... She basically... In the short, it's funny. She says, don't misbehave. I am... You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Because in the short, it's actually like a baby. Um, Jennifer Ken actually harkened back and says the monster is like the baby Baba Duke, And this is like the big Baba Duke. Okay. And the monster is actually a child in Monster. Okay. And so she yelled at it like, don't misbehave and stop scaring him. And you know what I mean? And then it retreats back into its closet where it lives. And in this movie, it's like... She does the same thing. She encounters it, but it's like she's encountering her own grief and she's screaming at it like, you're trespassing in my home. You're trespassing in my my being. In my life, yeah. Like, I can't move on. I can't live my life. I can't even celebrate my son's birthday on his actual birthday because you're here. You know what I and mean? And a birthday is just a celebration that someone is alive. You can't exactly. Even so she celebrate can't the celebrate fact that, the fact that, that her son's alive. I mean, alive. that's an indication of her anger at her son. She can't celebrate the fact that he's alive on the day that he was born. Um, she has to, like, change it, like, like a wish. But it's, like, in this moment when she's screaming at this thing, saying, you're trespassing in my home, it's, it's so powerful. I think she did such a fantastic job in that moment, the, the actress, because it's, like, she's... She, you know, that's kind of like what 
that's always what I think of as a solution to when something's in your home and you're uncomfortable. You have to tell it to fuck off, basically. <laughs> like, I know that's stupid, but no, but it's true because sometimes, because if you really think about it, what what is in your home? Is it really a ghost or is it just in your mind? What if you're the one who, like, is seeing something or uncomfortable, anxious, and it's almost like you need to tell yourself to snap out of it, but you can't tell yourself to snap out of it. If you talk to the thing, you're really talking to yourself. You know what uh, I mean? Yeah, that's yeah. why, like, I like that combination of is it psychological, is it not? And I, I, I like to, th- I mean, I, I'll agree with you. I think maybe it isn't, maybe there's more. Maybe there, there is something about a Duke. Maybe it was created by them. Maybe it was a manifestation of what they have, a monster of their own making. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? But yeah, but there's a moment when she screams at it and then it shrieks back at her like it's like a child, like pissed off. One of the things this movie. And then it rushes back into the basement. Doesn't deliver that some horror movies, most horror movies of this ilk do. Is there's usually that scene where, like, she's going to research and she's going to, like, oh, I'm going to figure out what a Babadook is in an afternoon and I'm going to go I online like and find something. But this movie never even has the pretense of, like, uh, trying to explain we're going to explain that this is some ancient evil because that we're going to have Vincent D'Onofrio Skype in. But that's None what of I, that stuff. But I like that because, to me, that's what it's trying to say. It doesn't want to distinguish between the psychological mm. and the supernatural. When you research the monster, the monster becomes an entity that has invaded your home. Mm-hmm. The Baba Duke might just be the invasion of their own feelings. You know what I mean? Like, she doesn't need to research the Baba Duke. She doesn't need to know what it is. She just knows what it's doing to her and her child. It's taking them over. It's making them crazy. It's giving them fear. You know what I mean? And I think that's a fantastic sort of idea concept i mean there's loss i mean there's real horror like she kills her dog <laughs> i was about just about to say that this yeah. movie takes it there this it, movie's like we're not gonna pussyfoot around the dog this time we're gonna take out the dog and as soon as that dog goes out you're like uh oh this movie could have a really really down ending possibly and my thing is though too What's really horrifying about that? Okay, let's explore this from two angles. The supernatural versus just the pure pure psychological. At the end of the movie, let's just, you know, jump to the end just to help explain this point. At the end of the movie, um, there's three things happen. There's a couple things happening. Uh, The son and the mother, they look so much better. They look rested. They look happy. They're about to celebrate the son's birthday. The the, um, child services people come back and he looks good. And they explain what's going on and everything seems okay. And then she goes into the basement um, with a bowl full of worms that she and the, her son just picked collected. out of the garden. And she sends the son outside, goes downstairs, and this there's something in there that, in like, the shadows. shadows, that starts yelling at her. And she tells it, it's okay, it's okay. Puts the bowl of worms down and leaves. And then the bowl of worms flies back over. into the shadows. Into the shadow. And then at the end, she's sitting there with her son in the garden. All right. So let's look at this from two perspectives. And Super. then what's the last line? The last line is, is like, um, I love you or your party is soon or something I lo- like it's that. It's like, I love you. She said, I love you. It's like really simple. And and so let's look at this from the two perspectives. Super lo- se- supernatural versus psychological. The supernatural is they have tamed this monster. Maybe they created it or whatever, invaded their home. You know, they're over their grief. The monster can't attack them anymore because they're not damaged. They're, they're healing and but it, it lives there still kind of like a it's been tamed or it's been contained or something and they just kind of have to deal with it like so it can be you know what I mean and then let's look at the psychological it's the metaphor of their grief that's been tamed right and the son and the mother are better but what's horrifying is if it's all purely psychological then she fucking went crazy and killed her dog in a moment of pure blind, just craziness, craziness, and now she and now shoves she's... bowls of, of of worms into the basement. Exactly, and tells her son to wait outside, and, tells her and son is to living wait outside with this delusion, with this delusion of this monster, or which is why I re- want to believe that, that there's a monster, that there's an actual monster. But that's the horror of it, isn't it? That's the real scariness. Is did she really recover? Like, you know, it's, see, it's it has a deceptively, oh, everything's okay ending. But, like, if you're looking at it from either perspective, is it really okay? They got a fucking monster living in the basement. 
whether the monster is living there by act of her imagination or by an actual monster living in the basement. See, but I think that this movie... I don't know, man. That's like, pretty... I, 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 I see, what, what I think is interesting is this movie, the ending reminds me of a Japanese horror movie ending. Yeah? Like, this is the type of ending that would come at the end of... of, uh, of of a Japanese horror movie where the monster isn't slain, but they find a place for it. They, yeah, a place to put it away. A place to put it away, but it leaves everything off normal, but it appears to be normal. Like mm-hmm. the end of uh, Suicide Club, as I said in our favorite horror movie podcast, the little creepy girls are still singing their creepy songs that make people kill people, but we have a place for them now, and we understand that, and it's okay, and the movie can go on because it's not our reality. Um, a bit, but it's it is a very interesting, you know, idea. Like if it's all psychological, the horror's still there. And I mean, I guess if it's not, if it is partly supernatural, I guess what well, they've learned to to tame the monster, that's less scary because they know how to deal with it. But if it's all psychological, then the the, the ending's not happy at all. It's terrifying. Yeah, she killed her fucking dog, and she's living with this manifestation of her create insanity and her grief in the basement it's like a deception because it's like is it just gonna go away that like and that dis- damage in her brain is just gonna disappear i mean come on and i think that's what's really scary is that the co- in the baba duke book the second time she, it, she tries to destroy it and it comes back to her it basically shows her losing her mind becoming possessed by the baba duke quote unquote and killing her child and her dog and it's kind of like is, you know what I mean? We're just waiting for the other shoe to drop is if the, we believe it's psychological. Yeah, if you believe it's all in her mind. Then we're waiting like for Duke 2 for her to kill her kid. And I don't know. It's just, it's just a very strange, scary idea that, like, this if she's living with this ill this mental illness that almost caused her to kill her kid, you know? But, like, the kid had to bring her back into the... That's another thing. Oh, I think... um. I, I made a comment when I was watching the movie. You know, when you first start the movie, the kid is super hyper and crazy and attention seeking and, you know, does doing all this just mad stuff, like running around throwing balls into the window and all this kind of stuff. As the movie goes on and the mother becomes more and more unhinged, the child becomes more and more self possessed and realizes that he has to do something about his mother, like losing her mind or being possessed by the Baba Duke or whatever. Um,. I don't know. It's so. It's just. It's so scary to imagine that the Baba Duke is just in their minds, and what he's telling her is, "Don't let the Baba Duke in." Like that's his name for like the crazy, the breaking of her mind. Don't let this anger and this rage at me yeah. and what happened. Like, and this kid has got to be by the end of this movie, he's gonna grow up and either be like the greatest magician ever. <laughs> Because he's seen real magic and has a monster in his basement and is obsessed with magic. Or he's going to grow up to be a horrible serial killer (laughs) or have horrible drug problems because his mother told him to eat shit and killed their dog and did horrible things. Sorry, my phone just restarted. I'm sorry. Um, The the one thing we haven't talked about yet Mm -hmm. about this movie that deserves a special praise. A special praise. A special that's Spanish for praise. It's special. Is the budget of this movie. Yes. How much do you... Because this movie looked so good. It looks like it's like it's really expensive and yet it's deceptively It looked like a three million dollar movie. It's two and a half million. Two and a half million? But at first I thought like just the acting caliber of it and the lighting and some of the effects they did with... With the dream sequences and stuff, I thought this movie might be ten million, or you know, might be a bigger movie than it yeah. appeared to be. It looked so it, good. You know, they did a great job with their first feature length movie making. Jennifer it look. Kent, um, she got she gained inspiration, which you can see in the movie. She gained inspiration from like old silent films and the use of like shadows. Um, to harken back to, to horror back in the day. Mm-hmm. And you can see that inspiration in the movie itself because there's a lot of sequences where the mother's sitting up and can't sleep 
and she's flipping through the channels and she sees she's watching old timey horror yeah. movies. And, and there's one and... there's one specifically that I wonder if they shot for the movie or if it's like actually... or if an actual old silent film that there's one that looks very much like the Baba Duke in the book. I'm I'm assuming they made it for the movie. Yeah, you think? I think so. What if it's an actual It doesn't say on the IMDb whether they did or not. Yeah. So I couldn't get any information on that. Um the only thing that took me out of the movie mm-hmm. was at one point the Baba Duck makes some noises that sound like a dinosaur. dinosaur from Jurassic Park. That's true. I did not I did not like that part cuz I felt like they needed some sound and they got some stuff cuz that is a dinosaur sound that from like an old tiny like movie or something yeah they used the claymation like i think i said needed some stock sounds maybe they did it on purpose i mean i don't know if it was to add comedy to the to the thing but it just kind of it was a little just silly. that one note hit off in the entire you yeah. know symphony that was the movie um the movie was very tight it's only 93 minutes long i think that i don't think it wasted any time it's 93 minutes but it feels like you're trapped in this situation I don't understand for a very found long this time movie boring like I, there was that was a critique that people said they found it boring. I don't get. I mean, I guess if you, I guess if you're not sold on the relationship of the son and the mother, and all you can focus on is how annoying the kid is, I guess you'd be bored. Yeah, I but could, I, but I could see how someone, the kid, might rub him the wrong way and ruin the movie for him. But see, that's the thing. But is, that's uh, yeah. that's someone who doesn't understand that children, actually. children are weird. And you, know you know what's know? funny? Exactly. And you know what's funny? I actually think that um, you know, I don't have any kids, and I don't really want one want any right now so like i'm not like Ooh, babies i'm just being like i've spent a lot of time around kids now because steven has six nieces and nephews and the more you are around children and i i don't particularly dislike children as well i like kids doesn't mean i want any it just means i like children i enjoy them i think they're interesting and funny and ridiculous um but you do see it like i think i think my experience with kids gave me the ability to watch this movie from a perspective of okay yeah this kid's being a little jackass but like let's wait and see why you know like there's no kid kids don't just behave the way they behave for no reason whatever whatever reason it is sometimes you know it may just be like it may just be they're experiencing a a, a, a mental moment a, a psychological moment where they're just like their brain chemistry is fucked up or something um it may just be they need to communicate for instance steven's nephew you know, he used to be really, like, he'd throw temper tantrums, horrible temper tantrums. He would scream the house down, and we would go, like, what the hell, man? This kid's fucking, like, oh, my God, when is he going to not do this anymore? And the minute he learned how to speak, he has become one of the most introspective little children I've ever seen in my life. Mm-hmm. And so you realize that that yelling and screaming and that frustration and that emotion that he experienced where he was just aggravating everybody was all because he didn't have the ability to speak. And the minute he learned how to communicate, he turned into a different kid. You know what I mean? And so I think that kind of gave me the minute, the patience to like watch this movie from a perspective of this kid's obviously going through something. Let's see what it is. And I'm sorry, like being with a single mom who is still super depressed with the death of her husband and whether or not she wants to admit it to herself is blaming her son for that death. Mm-hmm. That's going to fuck a kid up. That's going to make a kid over de- de- codependent. That's going to make a kid desperate for the need of approval from his mom. You know what I mean? Like, it's just gonna be, you know, it's, like it's it's a it's a it's a whole thing. It's like a it's a cycle. It's a cycle, exactly. And so I think that yeah, like, I guess I can see it though that if you can't get into the kid, if you can't be patient and wait and see what's going on with this kid or wait and see if he gets better, that yeah, you're totally gonna. Like, yeah. like, uh. And also, if you're not into the idea of less is more, yeah. if you can't get over that thing, you might just look at this movie and be like, they didn't do anything, you know? I didn't buy the fear. I'm not going to get scared by spooky noises. And see, to me, less is more. Because, like, you mentioned that, that scene in The Conjuring with the little girl staring into the darkness. That was, like, the scariest moment of that movie for me. Mm-hmm. Is that little girl's face and her fear... You know what I mean? And you don't see what's there, but, like, you can imagine the worst things in the world. Um, I really like this movie. I'm interested to see what Jennifer Kent does next. Yes. One of my favorite moments in the movie comes at the end when uh, her husband becomes, like, the embodiment of the Babadook and is telling her to bring, bring me the boy. And then it recalls back to the scene with 
uh, when she's at a parent teacher conference thing and they're talking to her son as the boy and she insists that they call him by his name. And that's the moment that she realizes that she like breaks the trance that she's in with the Babadook and realizes this is not her husband talking to her, but this is this outside entity trying to destroy them. Mm-hmm. And I thought that little piece of writing was just very well mm-hmm. done mm-hmm. and very effective and really sold the whole movie for me was that little callback. And every time, and you can see it every time people want to antagonize her child, her Samuel, they refer to him as her son, yeah. the boy. You know what I mean? They take away his identity. They take away his identity and just make him a problem. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of like, what if the Baba Duke is the embodiment of the kid's problems, not just her problems? You know, like what if the Baba Duke is the boy? <laughs> you know, like every dark, angry thing about him, and 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 having to sort of like explore that. Um, yeah, I think, I think this movie is great. And the movie really gives you a lot of moments of, to relax to. It has, like, the best, most sweet neighbor ever, who's just so kind and understanding old lady. But you relax because you worry that she's gonna die. Yeah, you worry she's gonna die, but she's, like, a sweet neighbor, and then it has a lot of, like, real moments, like, her, like, the, the mother going once the kid's asleep. And she pulls out her vibrator and tries to take, like, a moment to herself. Like, that, that was, was really so humanizing. Real. That was very real and human. And, yeah, it's so funny. You can see part of, like, her, her struggle is the fact that, um... Sorry if my, like, I was putting my hand by my face if I sound weird, but I don't sound weird anymore. Um, there, you see that moment. She keeps looking at couples kissing and romantic or moments and of affection and, stuff. and it's like you see that part of what's wrong with her is that she can't connect with someone else but she wants to mm-hmm. but she can't and there's like a co-worker that she has that uh obviously is interested in her romantically and she just can't even see it you know what i mean she's just so broken by the death of her husband uh, yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I, I think that this is such a powerful idea because it, it really is true. Like, wh- who wouldn't fucking just fall apart if the moment your entire life is being changed by the birth of a child, which is one of the hardest things you can ever do is raise a kid, then all your entire life changes again because the person that's supposed to help you do that is dead. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, she doesn't get any time to process that. She doesn't get a time to be away from her son to process the grief of her husband so she can love her kid. She just has to deal with it. Yeah. I think that is, I mean, that could break anybody. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a horrifying prospect. I think that's so sad. I, I think when I was watching the movie, it was like one of the moments I was just like, I was just like, this movie is so sad. Because it's just like, she's so what does you know when does she get a chance to like cope she doesn't and then it manifests into this ugly thing whether it's real or not real and then she finally has to face up to it in the most ridiculous overwrought Mm -hmm. way she can yeah it was a really great movie is that i would probably i'll probably never see this movie again though (laughs) (laughs) and that's a compliment to the movie not a diss at the movie because it's too emotional because it was just like too much of a ride to sit through again and you know the best the best viewing is always that first viewing where you know nothing of what's going into it um in 10 years i'll probably check this movie out again see if it's still scaring the bejesus out of me and (laughs) most likely will all right well i think that's uh good we talked a lot Ooh. Yeah, this went on longer than I expected. Sorry, guys. But, you know, we kill time, so you don't have to. Yeah. All right, well, I've been Danielle. I've been Steven. Please check out Vundablog.com. Tweet us at Vundablog or at Vundacast. Let us know what you thought of the Babadook and if we're full of Babadookiness or not. Um, Yeah, so this was a podcast. I'm Steven. This is Danielle. Goodbye. Good luck. Have some new fear in the new year. Check out the Babadook. Woot. Woot woot.
What was that noise I just heard? Stop that. Wundercast? Give yeah. it up for Wundercast, man. What an adorable name. 